Good afternoon. Welcome to American Bankers Association's webinar on Gremlin's Social Media Marketing for Banks, Overcoming the Six Compliance Key Hurdles. My name is Steve Plestak. I'm with the Endorsed Solutions Group here at the ABA. We'll get started in just a moment on this program discussing social media marketing for banks, overcoming the six compliance key hurdles. But before we end the program, let me run through some administrative issues. This webinar will run approximately 50 minutes. If you have any questions at any point, please send them using the Q&A message area. We'll have time after the presentation for a question and answer session. To send a question in the meeting window, open the Q&A window. Then type a message in the Q&A box and please send it to both host and presenter. We'll try to answer all your questions at the end of the presentation. If we can't answer all your questions, we'll get back to you after the webinar is ended. We'll also be distributing the presentation to all the attendees tomorrow, Thursday, May 26th. I would also like to note that the ABA endorses Gremlin for their social media marketing and compliance solution. Recently, Gremlin earned ABA's endorsement for their social media marketing and compliance solution. Gremlin combines social media management with compliance and ROI tracking tools that makes it easy for banks to master the social media marketing landscape and build business using social networks. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenters, Chris Maloney and John Grupella. Chris Maloney is the CEO of Gremlin, a leading social media and digital marketing company focused on helping businesses and individuals maximize their social media programs. Chris is a former Chief Marketing Officer for three major brands, Wells Fargo, Experian, Scottrade, and is a big believer in the power of marketing to drive business growth. Chris's expertise in driving companies to be highly successful in their digital and social media presence with measurable results. While Chris was at Wells Fargo Advisors, it became the number one ranked investment firm in the U.S. for social media followers during his tenure. Chris's team was recognized in 2014 for digital innovation with a 2014 Gramsci Institute Award for Best Financial Services Marketing Strategy in the U.S. Chris is a member of the National CMO Club and serves as president of the local chapter. Chris is truly passionate about his work and always eager to connect with the other marketers and strategic leaders. Next is John Krupella. John leads the strategic services for Gremlin Social Media with an emphasis on banks and financial institutions. John and his team created and led the 2015-2016 Gremlin ABA Bank Social Media Benchmark. John and his team have worked with dozens of ABA members to assist both with their marketing and compliance strategy. He comes to Gremlin having worked for a financial aggregator company as well as a creative agency. He has a background in engineering and computer science and is a graduate of Washington University in St. Louis. With that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Chris and John for their presentation. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. We appreciate you uh, dedicating an hour to talk a bit about social media and the banking world. We've got some very fun content here, some new things that we've created uh, over the last week based on some information we received from some regulators. So I think you're going to find this uh, interesting and fast-paced along the way. Do feel free to ask questions um, in the in the boxes as Steve described. We're very excited to be partners with the American Bankers Association on this, and uh, we're glad to have all of you joining us for this webinar. You'll also be able to vote on a number of questions throughout the uh, presentation today, so please take a look for the poll that will be popping up on screen. So a little bit about what we want to cover today. We've got six things we want to make sure we hit. We're going to talk about the banking guidelines for social media. We're going to talk about the social opportunity that we see for banking. It's big, and we want to share that with you. We want to talk a bit about uh, the risks of social media for banks. So this is one of the questions we get time and time again, or what are the risks, and how do we understand those risks? We want to talk about the six key hurdles to overcome uh, in order to do social media within the banking world. So um, we have talked to dozens and dozens of banks over the past number of months and have good clarity as to what we see as the hurdles, and we're going to have fun sharing those with you. Um, John will step in and talk about the results of our 2015-2016 benchmark study where we looked at some very specific strategic elements that banks are using to be successful in social media and how we score and rank banks in their social media presence. 
And uh, last but not least, we'll talk a bit how to fix some of these challenges that exist to bring the compliance and marketing together um, and a platform approach to doing so, leveraging technology. And along the way, we're going to drop in some bloopers. So um, we, uh, we all read on a daily basis about someone doing something crazy in social media. Instead of talking today about uh, that rock and roll celebrity or politician or um, someone from the Kardashian family, we're gonna talk about people in the financial world who've given themselves a big headache by not paying attention to what they're doing in social media. So let's dive in. Uh, just a quick uh, one slide so that you know a bit about Gremlin. Um, we bring together a knowledge of compliance from all of the regulatory bodies who govern the banking and financial industry. We'll talk today a lot about what we know in terms of that guidance from those regulators and how technology can help solve a lot of those uh, challenges or um, items that have come up from the regulatory bodies. Marketing, we are marketers. We believe in social media as an opportunity to build brand, build community, and grow your bank. It's one of the most cost-effective and we believe best ROIs that any organization in the banking world can use, so we're gonna talk about that. And then strategy, um, because in large part of our partnership with the American Bankers Association, we've gotten uh, very deep with a number of financial institutions of all sizes, whether it be a 200 million asset uh, bank to a $20 billion asset bank. We've got a deep understanding of what's been successful for them, what's worked, what's not worked, and so we share that um, with you today, and it's something that we work on in connection with the compliance and the marketing. Okay, so your favorite regulatory bodies are on this page here, FFIEC, FDIC, CFPB, and so on. These are all the uh, institutions that have uh, documented some sort of policy or guidance regarding social media. Um, we've looked at all of them. Um, the strictest probably is FINRA, who because they're dealing with financial advisors and my past life at Wells Fargo Advisors, I have a very good understanding of the, of the guidance from FINRA and uh, some of the things they think are very important when you're giving advice directly to a client. And then some of the more general and broad guidance coming from FFIEC and FDIC, we're gonna share some very specifics with you today and hopefully turn it into a friendly discussion. If you have questions after the webinar, we're happy to answer those as well. So here's what I'd like to share. Um, this is a list that we created uh, literally over the last week it has been updated based on some conversations I've had with uh, FDIC attorneys and FFIEC uh, members recently. The first thing you have to have in terms of a bank to do social media is a governance policy. This is governance is a word used across the board for many things and in social media, it specifically relates to the access and controls and documentation that you have on how uh, your organization is going to use social media and very particularly who's allowed to use social media representing your bank. It's very important that we're gonna draw some distinctions here that your bank is an entity and there are going to be people who represent your bank. And then there are individuals using social media and sometimes those individuals are representing the institution. Oftentimes they're doing so personally. So we're gonna draw some lines about that. In the case of governance though, we're talking specifically about who can represent the institution. Social media policies and procedures is a very high priority, making sure that the organization has them and understands them both for personal and for business use as well as those who are representing the institution know what the policies and procedures are. Monitoring and oversight, focusing on what's being published, what's being said about you by clients, employees, customers, and monitoring your uh, web presence and your social presence to, to understand what's being said. Having a risk management process, so just like any other communication or approval process within your bank, um, someone might create an item of content and someone might have to approve that content, whether that's a manager or a compliance officer, making sure that you have an approval and tracking of that approval process in place. Um, the new one here is training, and I'm gonna come to training on the next slide, but um, suffice it to say that um, input that I've received from the regulatory bodies is that training is gonna be the hot button for the next year. Um, they have seen a gap in institutions actually doing proactive training 
um, to uh, team members within the banks um, on what they can do and what they can't do. And uh, it is now going to be imperative that institutions have a robust and rigorous training policy, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. And then last but not least, it's important to archive and be able to report for auditing purposes on what's going on on the social media platforms that you own or any other social media uh, platforms or places that you engage, um, tracking what's being said and what's going on. The big three, of course, are Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. So specifically about training, um, in talking with FFIEC and FDIC uh, folks, um, compliance is one of the areas where we need to make sure that within the bank, compliance understands what all the rules are. Um, the challenge here sometimes is that compliance, by not knowing what the rules are, is more likely to say no and create obstacles for team members or employees, which actually creates risk. If compliance isn't clear on what the rules are, um, employees may uh, decide to not follow compliance or, or may struggle with understanding compliance's direction. So compliance comes first. The second group that needs to be trained are the marketing and social media team. Um, I'll refer to them as the brand team. If you're a small institution and we work with a number of those who have one person who does both marketing and PR and even deals in customer service areas, um, that person needs to understand what they're allowed to do. And in some of our larger institutions, there's an entire social media team of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 people. So that team needs to be trained next to make sure they all understand the rules. The next group is the customer facing team, whether this be a customer care group or anyone who has a direct customer relationship. So anyone from a branch manager to a personal banker to uh, anyone who really deals directly with customers and could interact with customers in social media, they must be trained. Um, I don't wanna put them too far down the list, but I do wanna include them and that is executives. We're gonna talk today about the pros and cons of executives using social media. And suffice it to say that you do wanna make sure you get their buy-in and ideally uh, senior leaders are at least familiar with the basics of, of LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, and that they understand that things they say can represent the institution. And then last but not least, make sure all employees know. So even employees who may not have a direct customer interface, we're gonna show you some examples today of employees who've made some mistakes on behalf of their institution and um, the risk that that uh, means to you, uh, whether you're in marketing or compliance or operations for your bank. All right, so we're gonna take a poll here, if you would. Please take a look at the screen and look for the poll. How would you describe the size of your bank? Small, medium, large, or national bank? Please vote now, A, B, C, or D. And reviewing the results quickly here, the poll uh, is about to close. We have um, the largest group are actually medium-sized banks, which is now about 35%. 30% are small, 19% of you are with large banks, and 15% with national banks. So the fortunate component here is we are gonna be gearing a lot of our information toward the small and medium-sized institutions who are looking to get into social media. A quick comment here with regard to what is social media? For the bank, it is both advertising and customer communication. And by that, we have to follow all these wonderful alphabet soup of rules that have come out that impact our policies and procedures across the institution that also apply directly to social media. So whether it be truth in savings or truth in lending, all the rules about sharing uh, interest rates and, and things that may be uh, not allowed apply in social media as they would in any other communication vehicle. Um, in our tool, Gremlin, we actually have the ability to filter words and we look for words like guarantee and interest rate to prevent those from going out. Um, but what we find time and time again is people using uh, promotional words or phrases in social media um, that, that present some risk to the bank because social media is out there forever. It's not a limited window of time. It's out there forever. The other thing I'll point out here is that Social media is not the same thing as advertising. Um, you're gonna see us talk about how social media expectations are heavily around education, as well as some level of entertainment and personal finance. 
they don't want to be marketed to or sold to, product promotion doesn't work very well. And so we want to think of uh, social media as having to follow the rules of advertising and customer communication, but how you actually do that communication uh, will be likely different in social media. The next thing, social is, social is also a channel for a customer complaint function. You have this within your bank right now. Banks must understand what they want to monitor and do a risk assessment, know what they're not monitoring, and tailor your policies and procedures based on the size of your bank and the level of your social media participation. And follow your bank's standard guidelines with regard to the consumer complaint function. So it is both advertising and customer communication as well as social media is tied into your consumer complaint function. Most of the regulatory bodies have shared how to handle consumer complaints. Um, this one might be new, and that is, it is an employee communication channel. Increasingly, your bank is talking to existing employees and their families in social media, whether that be LinkedIn or Facebook or otherwise. So banks should take the time to address the risks of employee use of social media, uh, be sure they understand their policies, and know that those employees are communicating with them directly on social media channels. Uh, one of the law firms that we work with has also said be mindful of NRA rules prohibiting employee retaliation against employees for discussing terms and conditions or other matters. Um, there are some uh, labor laws that apply in terms of what you allow or don't allow your employees to do. So this becomes an HR, uh, a legal and a compliance function as well. And then last but not least, be sure to understand and communicate when social is for business purposes versus uh, personal social media rights. In this case, um, LinkedIn is most often going to be considered a business purpose channel. So if you're doing things on LinkedIn that are uh, heavily personal, LinkedIn is a public channel and available to everyone and you're officially representing your institution, so it needs to be viewed as a business channel. However, if you have a personal Facebook page that you share only with friends and family, uh, more often than not, that's not going to be considered uh, a business channel, and the institution will not be able to govern um, what you do on that personal channel. It becomes a little hairy if that person is an executive, and it becomes a little more complex, too, if that person decides to bring business contacts into their Facebook family. For example, loan officers within banks will very often communicate with real estate agents and other partners using their Facebook page. That puts them at much greater risk, and I'll show you some examples of that. You can also have two Facebook pages, a personal and a business page, and we're helping some of our institutions do that for individuals. Why do social media? So here are the goals that we see most often. Number one is to acquire new customers. Social is a great channel to educate and bring new people into your bank. Number two is to deepen relationships with existing customers. It is an awesome tool to educate your existing customers, talk to them on a regular basis. Time and time, the bank satisfaction surveys that I work with with J.D. Power show that the frequency and uh, explanation and information and education that you get from your institution helps to determine your loyalty to the bank. And so social media has become an unbelievable, powerful tool to help educate existing customers. Community engagement. If you're a community bank and in a, in a local area, it's an awesome way to share the things you're doing in the community and stories about how your institution is part of the community, and that helps drive customer loyalty as well as community awareness. Employee advocacy and empowerment. Um, John and I believe this is the most underutilized opportunity in social media. Um, we have yet to find a bank that uses this, I would even say, above average. Um, this is one of the most powerful things you can do. We're going to share with you how to do it later in this presentation, but it also creates some risks, and we'll share what those risks are. And then reputation management, um, how do you build your brand, how do you manage your reputation, how do you make sure you show up favorably when customers of the bank are out there talking about you, and um, those are two very important goals as well. All right, the risks. We're going to break the risks into three buckets for purposes of making it easy to understand. The first is the compliance and legal bucket. Um, under compliance and legal, You'll see that it's the laws and regulations for deposit and lending products, and it's the stuff we talked about around advertising, complaints, employees, and customer communication. The second bucket is reputational risk, brand risk, brand impact, PR. I've got some fun examples for you here momentarily. And the third bucket is operational risk. So is there a data risk or 
We've even had issues where we've seen phishing and spoofing through social media channels, making sure you understand those as well. So compliance, reputation, and operational are the three risks. So here's one of my favorite stories. If you uh, are listening to this webinar and have attended a social media event over the past few years, you've undoubtedly repeatedly heard the United Breaks Guitar story. But for those of you who may not be in social media, this might be a new one. A number of years ago, a musician was flying United Airlines and the baggage handlers, he witnessed them throwing his guitar onto the aircraft and in, in turn, it actually broke his guitar. And he was flying to play music at an event and his guitar arrived broken. Uh, they posted this video that was making fun of United and how no one paid attention to him from a customer service perspective. And ultimately, despite multiple escalations, um, he was unable to get any remedy from United on his guitar, which could have been repaired for about $1,200. Um, how many people viewed his video on YouTube? Well, as of yesterday, when I looked, it was 15,752,000 who had viewed this video, uh, a rather funny video you can check out after the webinar about how United broke his guitar. Is 15 million views a lot? Well, I would say so. I took a look yesterday also at Hey Jude by the Beatles, a pretty awesome song that everybody knows, and it had 15 million views on YouTube as well. So for what it's worth, this one customer complaint from one person was viewed as much as Hey Jude. Not good for your brand. According to Fast Company, that video, United Breaks Guitars, cost United Airlines and its investors upwards of $180 million in the value of the stock. In the days following the publishing this video, which went viral, um, millions and millions and millions of people viewed it, and it showed up all over the news channels. CNN, CNBC, everyone was talking about United Breaks Guitars. The culmination of this terrible press was a $180 million loss to the United stock. If you don't think social media can hurt your business, take a look at United Breaks Guitars. So, seeing the United Breaks Guitars story, what do you think of it? please take a look at the poll question on your screen. Do you find it to be funny, scary, stupid, or hey, United deserved it? Please answer now using the poll box on the right-hand side of your screen. Excellent gotten lots and lots and lots of responses here, so we'll give you another few seconds to respond. There are a few folks who haven't yet weighed in, and here we have it. So this was a pretty good horse race for most of it between scary and United deserves it. So uh, we have some uh, folks out there who have some negative opinions about United, but ultimately the most common answer of you was that that is scary, and the second most common answer was um, United deserved it. So whichever view you have, it's worth saying, boy, we better be conscious of social media and the risk that it poses to our organization. Here's a quote from an FFIEC ruling that says, a financial institution should have a risk management program that allows it to identify, measure, and monitor and control the risks associated with social media. A financial institution that has chosen not to use social media should still consider the potential negative comments or complaints that may exist within the many social media platforms and when appropriate, evaluate what, if any, action should be taken to monitor and comment to, on them. So that's an FFIEC guidance, and it addresses the very thing we saw from United Breaks Guitars. The next guidance we have is from the FDIC, and it says, it's important to remember that social media provides a channel for people to say basically whatever they want. We wanted to call financial institutions' attention to that, to say that even if the financial institution thinks that it's not involved in social media, in the sense that it doesn't have a Facebook page or Twitter account and so forth, people may be using social media to talk about that financial institution. So whether you're wanting to be in it or not, um, you're in it and it's important to proactively address it. And for that reason, we actually say, if you're gonna be in social media, be proactive and make sure that it drives positive results and positive brand for your bank. Let's dive into the six key hurdles. I'm gonna move fairly quickly through these. Hurdle number one is fear. We hear it time and time again. And when my team picked this image from the Home Alone movie, I had to struggle a bit with it. And then I thought about how, while I was at Wells Fargo, a compliance leader came to me and said, 
I really don't want to be doing social media. We keep having all these social media things invading us, and we can't keep them out. How do we get out and keep social media away from us? We don't want to do it. And it reminded me of Macaulay Culkin uh, trying to keep the robbers out of his house with all these people trying to break in and force you into something that you didn't want to do in social media. And guess what? You can't avoid it. How to overcome those fears? Just do it. Learn enough about social media that you get involved on a personal level with your personal presence, and then leverage that to understand what you can do from a business perspective. Start small and focus on goals. Whatever your institution is doing today, we have some social media superstars that we work with, and we have a number of banks that are just getting started. Start small and be very goal-oriented. Number three is have a personal presence yourself. Try out some new things. If you've never used Twitter, sign up for it and understand how millions and millions and millions of people get their information through Twitter every day and why that might be beneficial for you as a bank to leverage it. Don't let compliance scare you. Compliance within the banks um, should know that the regulators want you to be in social media. They need you to be conscious of social media. So if a compliance person doesn't understand the rules, and the rules, I admit, are sometimes complicated, it's important that we not be scared off um, by just saying no. Leverage technology tools. We see a real opportunity to solve these compliance issues by proactively implementing some technology and automation. We'll talk about what those are here shortly. Number two hurdle is understanding the alphabet soup of regulators. Man, there are a lot of folks who weighed in on this. And here's one, an attorney uh, who was with the FDIC. We're not trying to discourage financial institutions from using social media. We recognize that social media can be a useful tool for financial institutions. It can allow them to reach a wider universe of customers. It can let them spread their brand identity more widely. It can help them deepen their relationships with existing customers and so forth. There are definitely good reasons for financial institutions to be in social media. And Elizabeth, who was with the FDIC, is now in private PAP practice. Um, and I've spoken to her recently, and she's continuing to do uh, consulting with banks and institutions on how to use social media. And the three things we want to gather from the comments from the FDIC are that regulators actually want you to be in social media. Number two, regulators want you to educate customers and use it as a positive channel to interact with customers. And number three, that the guidance wants to make sure that you treat it as a new channel of communication. However, all the same foundational compliance requirements exist. So truth in lending and all the other rules that you follow for any other activities, they carry over directly to what you do in social media, as well as what your employees do in social media. Please take a look at this post, give it a read, and tell me what you think John Rocket Roberts might have been doing wrong on behalf of his bank. So, as you read through this, I'll tell you a little bit about John. He's a loan officer, he's with a bank, and he decided to post to all of his contacts, which include businesses, the post about his December holiday party at his manager's house where they were celebrating having a great year. They had a crazy Christmas cocktail party. Apparently, he had lots and lots of Patron shots, but he also wants to thank his customers for making it a great year. He couldn't have had that alcoholic binge night with his coworkers without his great customers. His head hurts the next day, and if you need a mortgage or refi, please call Rocket. So let's take a look at what concerns might exist here. Is this a brand risk or uh, operational risk, or is this a compliance risk? So take a look at the poll you have on the right-hand side of your screen and let me know what you think Rocket Roberts has done in terms of creating risk for his bank. All right, so we'll close out the poll here in just a couple minutes. We've got a couple more folks voting. Excellent, excellent uh, volume of voters. You are a very uh, active voting audience here. We appreciate it. Rocket Roberts has definitely gotten your attention. So indeed, the vast majority of you said that Rocket Roberts has created reputational risk. By sharing this information with a large number of people, um, he's created some risks that may not be compliance issues and the FDIC may not fine you, but I can assure you a number of customers or potential customers that are reading about your bank uh, might have reservations about Rocket Roberts strategies. 
Um, the other thing to consider is, was Rocket Roberts given any description of what he should be doing in social media? Was he told not to do it? Was he told to consider that he's a, a senior uh, lending loan officer with a bank and maybe he shouldn't be posting that kind of stuff? If he wasn't trained, it might be hard for the firm to um, come after him. So consider that as a potential training issue and definitely a PR brand risk issue. For what it's worth, it's a mini United Breaks Guitars for Rocket Roberts. Internal training. We talked about this earlier, and I won't spend a whole lot of time on it today, but it's definitely something you should consider as a priority for the coming year. Training is urgently needed. Here is yet another loan officer. What is it with these loan officers? Um, and this is a real estate loan officer who does uh, consumer retail mortgage. Take a read on what Robert, and I've blocked out Robert's name for his own protection. Take a look at what Robert is recommending on behalf of his institution. So this has been one of the most fun this year, I have to admit, is politics. As much as we hear on the radio, TV, news, day in and day out, all of it, you can't escape the amount of discussion around politics. Whatever candidate you're for, it might even be today what more candidate you're against and what you want to say about that candidate. However, if you're with a financial institution and you're posting on behalf of that institution, which Robert is here, and he's recommending who to vote for, again, this is a reputational risk issue here. Regardless of what candidate you think should win the election, and it looks like his colleague Vince has an alternate candidate that's been recommended by his boss, whichever candidate that they're recommending, there is risk to talking politics if you're in the business world, and I think that's true for sure in banking. Number four, executive buy-in. So when I started at Wells Fargo uh, five and a half years ago, I had an executive who ran our private client group who said, no customers that we have will ever use social media. We don't want to be in social media. In 2012, the same person said to me, well, they might be in social media, but none of our customers would ever use social media to talk to a financial advisors. We came back with a report showing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of communication from customers to financial advisors. And then he came back to me and said, well, let me revise what I said. They might be sending information, but it's not important. And for heaven's sakes, we'll never get a new customer using social media. Why on earth would we spend time building out this social media platform that you want to do, Chris? So I ran into about as much skepticism as you could imagine. And uh, the, the answer to number, uh, the 2013 quote was, some research conducted by Putnam uh, Research every year shows that the average active financial advisor who uses social media, the average, gained 4.6 million in incremental assets by using social media. This is a Putnam Investments report that they've published for the last number of years. It's an excellent report, and it's self-reported by financial advisors who've been able to track, because of how they manage their book of business, that they're getting inquiries directly through social channels. I have a financial advisor who went to a particular high school here in St. Louis and told me he gained a multi-million dollar account when he added the name of his high school to his LinkedIn. And I convinced him to do so, and he said, I thought we weren't ever supposed to talk about high school once we graduated from college. And I said, well, you know, if you went to a high school that a lot of people know and you wanna plug it in there, maybe it'll benefit your network. And lo and behold, it has caused him to add uh, some big accounts by simply connecting with some high school classmates on LinkedIn. So think about that for any relationship manager you have at the bank. Do you see social media as a relationship opportunity for them to connect and grow the business? Number five, measuring success. I'm going to make this very, very easy. There are thousands of blog posts written about this, and my team has written numerous articles about how to measure social media and how to be successful. And I'm going to start with the basic stair step. The first thing you want to make sure is that if you're on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, and other platforms, that your platform is complete, that you show up the way you want to show up, and you show up in consistency with the other brand that you have. How many connections or followers or fans do you have? On LinkedIn, you actually have employees who attach to you as well as people who follow your LinkedIn page. You might think LinkedIn is a place to go for job information or talk to prospective employees. We're going to talk to you about how many customers are watching your LinkedIn page. Posting content, we look at what you post and how many people see the post, and then we look at the engagement in those posts. Are people commenting or liking or interacting with that engagement or sharing? You can see something like the United Breaks Guitars, which was shared thousands of times on Twitter. 
sent people to YouTube to watch the video, and lo and behold, you had a viral story. If you're engaging the right customers um, uh, to interact with your social media, you're going to see a big impact. And then impact. If you're a community bank, you may be focused on brand, and you may be focused on how to make your members feel uh, closer to you. If you're a large institution like I was with, we actually were able to measure new customers and accounts. And in some cases, we were actually to take your online profile around customer loyalty and determine if your engagement with us in social media had a potential impact on your overall relationship with the institution and whether you looked at new accounts, whether you looked at adding things. Uh, impact is a, is a powerful thing when you can see that directly happen through social media. One of our digital marketing managers at Pulaski Bank, who we run a program for, said, our team that uses social media adds one to two customers per month. It's our best ROI. So a marketing leader who believes social media is the best ROI in the institution, which is all the more reason why we need to understand the risks and understand how to make this go easier, because it isn't always that easy. Um, it's challenging, and you need to have an automated way to do it. Uh, email and putting things out on a shared folder and having people sign on sheets of paper on what you're going to do isn't that easy to use. So if you decide to go toward having a platform and an automated way to do it, make sure that platform is, number one, easy to use by whoever's composing content in social media and whoever's approving content in social media. Have a marketing library for publishing and approvals so that you have content there that is approved and is available to other people. Have the ability to use a calendar. Um, as John, who's about to speak, can attest, we had a lot of people that we were looking at who posted a Happy New Year's a few days after Happy New Year's or Happy Easter on the Monday after Easter because they decided to send the post when they got to their computer. Make sure you have a calendar that sends posts at the optimal time for maximum impact. And there's some very good research out there about when people are checking that information. It's often on their mobile phone, so be conscious of mobile device and how people consume information on a mobile device. We've talked extensively about compliance and governance, so all of that keyword tracking and phrase filtering are the kinds of things that should be built into your platform. And last but not least, the ability to measure and track what's working and not working and um, leverage these uh, social channels to drive measurable results, learn from what doesn't work and do it again and try something that you think might work better. All right. Given that Gremlin is based here in St. Louis, we are completely biased on this next poll question, so I'm going to vote a couple times. But who do you think is going to win the NHL Stanley Cup this year? What team do you have, San Jose, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, or Tampa Bay? Please vote now in the poll. All right, we have some reluctant hockey fans here who don't want to vote, but we'll give you another minute. And I will tell you that winning the poll currently is the Pittsburgh Penguins, followed by our St. Louis Blues, and then tied for unlikely are the Sharks in Tampa Bay. So we'll see what happens in the coming week in terms of who makes it to the Stanley Cup. So I'd like to introduce John Crapella for my team. He's going to talk about our 2015-2016 Bank Social Media Benchmark Study. We did some real data collection from ABA member banks, and he's going to share some of those results. Awesome. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, like he mentioned, we gathered a lot of information, and as Steve mentioned earlier, we have, we've worked with dozens of ABA member banks as well as other financial institutions to gather this information. So what is a benchmark? Uh, through assessments that we've done, we've gathered hundreds of data points to put towards really um, standards for the financial services industry for social media. Here you'll see the marketing scores. So on these sliders, you'll see a solid bar. That's where the average is for banks on social media. Then you'll see a box. That's where if we do a benchmark for your bank, we, we will give you a range. We'd say you're you know, somewhere around 60 points maybe for presence, or maybe a little bit lower. Uh, this is a very, we look, at your, we look at your social media, we get a great idea from all the other data gathering that we've done, all the learning that we've done, and we give you a quick look at where you stand compared to your competitors. This is an example I pulled from a benchmark I did last week. Uh, and as you can see, um, the scores aren't excellent here. Uh, and overall, that's what the benchmark study found. 
banks are far behind other industries. Uh, you know, the marketing score, the slide you saw previously with the sliders, that's going to be an average of D on a scale from zero to 100, you know, going back to school, thinking about A, B, C, D, marketing, banks struggle with it, um, especially the engagement side of things I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, and then the risk side as well, uh, you know, some banks, they think that being on social, or uh, not being on social rather, doesn't open them up to as much risk. It's actually, we found the opposite, that banks who aren't on social aren't able to monitor themselves as well, uh, and that they don't have a place for customer communication to occur on the social media platforms. So five lessons that we learned through the benchmark study. The first one, bigger isn't always better. The graph you'll see, you see on your screen, um, it's the score going on the y-axis, and then on the x-axis, you'll see asset class. So from three to 600 million, there's a lot of variance on bank social media presence. And then as you see, as you get a little bit bigger, it actually dips, and this was surprising to us. We, we, after looking at the numbers, looking at the banks that we worked with, we found out that there's a transitional stage between community and regional banks where a lot of the banks that we saw struggled to maintain the, the close-knit um, community, the social communities that they had established within, you know, their three or four branches in their community as they expanded to more of a regional size. And then as really they solidified that regional footprint, you'll see uh, we had several banks around that $3 billion mark and just below that, it actually goes back up. So, you know, that's, those are the banks where there's established social media teams, not just, you know, one person doing social media. They have teams committed to social media. What's interesting, John, is that at that billion-dollar mark, too, there seems to be a change in the attitude toward compliance. So banks mm -hmm. will be more strict and more structured in restricting and holding back um, what the, the bank can do in social media because of compliance restrictions. So that's why we think um, these learnings are particularly valuable because um, these smaller institutions actually have a strategic advantage over some of the larger institutions, and I think that's important for both to, to know. Absolutely. Totally agree. The second lesson we have here, great content does not always get the great engagement you would expect. So here's an excellent example of that. West Plains Bank here in Missouri uh, shared this article, you know, focused around how can you help your children succeed uh, in, in their financial endeavors later in their life. Uh, great article uh, if you go on to read it. Unfortunately, it didn't get the amount of likes that you would expect, especially given their community. Their, the community they're in is all about um, great families and raising children in a very solid way. So this was kind of a surprise to us, uh, and it's something that just happens, and it's something that banks do struggle with, getting great engagement. The next lesson uh, is all about great engagement. You'll see the puppies on your screen. Uh, this is a bank out of Colorado, around the Denver area. Uh, this particular post was about puppy rescue that they support. Uh, always great engagement when you get puppies on social media. <laughs> the next lesson, LinkedIn works for banks, and I would say all across financial services. So it's really the focus has been, uh, you know, looking at employees, uh, especially current employees on LinkedIn. We actually see it as a great channel to talk to your clients, your customers, uh, personally, I will say I follow my financial advisor on LinkedIn. I get great articles from them all of the time, uh, daily basis from them. They are a national chain, uh, a national brokerage. Definitely LinkedIn we see as an under underutilized channels is what we found. Uh, but those banks that were utilizing LinkedIn in an effective way, it was having an, a massive impact. Uh, as Chris mentioned earlier, the Pulaski Bank, you know, they're getting one to two new clients a month uh, for each employee on social. Great opportunity here uh, moving forward into 2016 for banks. And it's LinkedIn has become a channel. Like I mentioned, I get daily information from my financial advisor. Uh, it's very much leaning more towards a Facebook where you share content and you get engagement with that content. And the, the fifth lesson that we learned is employee advocacy is a very effective strategy for banks. Few banks are using this strategy effectively. 
Those that we saw who were effectively using the strategy, unbelievable organic spread of their social presence. Um, Chris, do you want to talk to the Yeah, uh, we've, we've uh, cited some of this quote before, but essentially mm -hmm. we see it as a very effective way if you can create content that is available for employees, especially those customer-facing employees to share, you can have a real positive impact. Absolutely, and that's a great strategy uh, for banks. It takes minimal effort both on the bank's part uh, as far as organically spreading your digital footprint, uh, and it also helps your employees, especially your customer-facing employees, establish their expertise for their personal network. It really turns social media into that awesome viral opportunity that we've talked about previously, which is you may share something on the bank Facebook page, but when you get dozens or hundreds of employees sharing that same great story about the puppy rescue, and it's going out to thousands and thousands of people who are friends of employees of the bank, you see an incredible viral impact of the power of social media. And it's more than you're going to get from posting on your uh, bank, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. So uh, focusing on strategy for a bit, I think the thing we want to summarize with is that um, setting very clear goals at the outset of what you're trying to accomplish in social media is important. A lot of institutions have said, hey, we've got to get into social media. We want to get into social media. We've been forced into social media. But I absolutely think it's time to back up and make sure that you set smart goals on what you're trying to accomplish in social media. Who are you talking to? Who's your audience? The content should be designed to educate and solve problems for that audience. While I was with, it, with it Wells Fargo when we first launched in social media, we thought we were talking to prospective customers when we launched on Facebook. And after time, we came to realize uh, a high percentage, a majority of the people following us on Facebook were current customers as well as current employees. So making sure your content uh, talks to that right audience and uses the language uh, of that audience. The size of your bank and your footprint, look at the competitors in your footprint and banks of similar size in terms of what they're doing and how they're engaging. And last but not least, evaluating how do we potentially grow the team that's managing social media, whether that be marketing or PR or communications folks, or maybe even adding someone to manage the compliance element. Um, what do you need to build that team out to be successful in social media? I believe you can get there by building a bigger team if you show a business case and show that it's working. Um, I've been able to do that a number of times. Show it's working and the budget will come with you. So here's a question for everybody to answer. Do you know if your bank currently uses a social media technology platform to publish and to ensure compliance in social media? This is a yes, no, or I'm not sure. Yes, no, or I'm not sure. Please vote now. We'll take about five seconds here to finish up the voting. Good response rates again. Lots and lots of folks voting. So um, it looks like the majority say, no, we don't have any sort of a technology platform and we don't use any tool to manage marketing and compliance for social. Uh, there's a group who say yes, probably about 30% say yes and about 20% say they're not sure. So let's talk a little bit about what that is since uh, about half of the folks uh, don't have a platform. When we talk about what you should look for in a platform, I believe that it needs to be easy to use. Social media is a new thing for many of us. Um, and so all of the members of the team need to be able to log on and uh, use it quickly and easily from a computer. Um, a, you need to have a marketing library where content is created and published and made available for publishing and there's an approval process. I've already talked about the need for a content calendar to make sure you post content um, over an appropriate period of time. Some of it will be spontaneous, but a lot of it is great to schedule when you know your people are going to be pulling up their Facebook. We've talked a lot about the compliance and governance structure, the approval process and keyword ar archiving and filtration. Um, bringing marketing and compliance together is where this automation really rocks because <clears throat> those two things, if brought together, can save a lot of time and relieve a lot of headaches for the compliance team. Making sure you're ready for an audit and able to report. Um, I have been a part of a number of both internal and regulatory body audits where they came in and said, show us what happened in social media from this date to this date. <clears throat> and they're doing more and more of that. A lot of times those audits are coming as part of a, of, a, of a larger audit, but they are happening and so you need to be prepared. And then social media is a measurable results 
uh, engine. So leverage the fact that you're going to be able to track and measure what's working, and that will help you build a business case to grow your social media presence. Um, as Steve mentioned at the outset, we were endorsed by the American Bankers Association, so we're happy to help uh, members with their social media needs and programs. Um, I will also say that uh, we uh, are able to help if you have a legal question. We have a number of uh, attorneys and firms that we work with. Uh, John here from my team, there's his email. If you have a question that's a legal question, let us know what it is and we'll get an attorney or a firm or a regulator to help you answer that question. We might be able to answer some of them as well, so feel free to do that. We also have a form available at abasocial.gremlin.com. And then in partnership with the American Bankers Association, we're offering everyone uh, a 20% discount on the Gremlin social media platform. That's our annual platform for your bank. So um, as an ABA member, you receive 20% off the cost of that platform. And um, for those who are attending and listening into the uh, last 10 minutes here of this webinar, we're also offering $1,000 in social media services, which is the team that John manages. For anybody who is interested in scheduling a demo and is able to call or email or fill out a form and schedule that demo by May 31st, we will also add $1,000 of strategic services to uh, you, and that will include things like the ability to do a benchmark assessment of you against other banks, um, a competitive analysis, and some other projects that might be of value to you if you're looking to up, up your social media game. And if you need more information about um, any of this, uh, you'll see Amanda Van Diver's phone number, her email, and uh, the easiest thing to do is to visit abasocial.gremlin.com and fill out a quick form, and we'll get you some information. So key takeaways before we go to Q&A, banks must monitor corporate social media accounts, so you're there, be active. The risks and hurdles can be overcome through policies, procedures, tools, and training. So know that there are solutions. The average banks are behind, as John talked about. They're not doing as well as the Coca-Colas and Pepsis and Budweiser's of the world, and that's because they're banks. But they have very valuable customers, and a lot of them, and so we need to figure this out. Banks uh, can win on social media through great content and a good strategy. We do have great examples of that. Employees represent great risk. Don't forget John Rocket Roberts and his wonderful post, but there's also examples where they're representing great opportunities. So if it's your group or another group, encourage them to train and educate employees on how to use social. And last but not least, technology can help manage that burden by bringing the marketing and compliance components together in one. So with that, let's open it up for Q&A. Uh, I believe Steve is able to take Q&A questions if you want to enter them now onto the screen. Um, yep. And uh, we'll take 10 minutes to answer questions. So, Steve, take it away. Okay. The first question then is, Chris, do you advise employees use branded Twitter handles when speaking on behalf of the bank? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Branded Twitter handles when speaking on behalf of the bank. So, um, we spent a lot of time on this while I was at Wells Fargo. I think um, that, that there, there, that's going to have to be a specific issue that we would talk about with that individual on. I would say that um, a lot of institutions where you are specifically representing that institution, and um, let's say it's you're a financial advisory firm, um, Morgan Stanley might be an example where your name and the firm name or an abbreviation of the firm name appear in your Twitter handle because the firm wants to continue to have ownership of that Twitter handle, but in your institution, it might be appropriate for you to have a business Twitter handle, and that one is not attached to the business. So there is an NLRB uh, ruling out there about what is business and what is personal, and I think uh, it's going to be up to the individual institution to set that as a compliance rule. I have seen it go both directions, um, where some people come into the, the, the company, the bank, and they use their existing Twitter handle, and in some cases, if they're uh, in a very customer-facing role, the institution will require them to set up a Twitter handle that includes some reference to the institution. All right, next question up is, what role, oh, just moved, one second here, they're coming in quickly, what role can social media play in a crisis management situation? That's a good question, and I've actually had to deal with that. So I would say um, this is where social media does have a tight relationship with the PR function. Um, I have run into this in a number of occasions, and it can be a very good way to get uh, information out. 
um, uh, to an audience that's correcting information that might be said, um, the, the ability to respond quickly to something that's said about you, especially if it's incorrect, uh, a social channel can be a great way to redirect people. Um, looking for something that might be said that's uh, uh, an accusation or even a potential risk of fraud, I think the institution should use social channels to get that information out as quickly as possible. And so that's where the PR or potentially the uh, investor management group within a, an institution needs to be tied tightly to social and the team that manages social. It isn't just a marketing function. It's probably one of the fastest ways you can get information out. Um, so I highly recommend using it. It's also subscribed to typically by people who are most interested in the institution. So it's a very, very fast, clean way to get information out if you're correcting a potential risk, um, reputational risk that comes up. Okay, thank you. Next one up is concerning audits. If we post spontaneously through the actual social platform, what is the best way to record and report for, for auditing? So, um, unfortunately, if you're posting directly to Facebook, um, you will have to have some other technology that, uh, that, that uh, archives what's being said on Facebook. You have to have, in the case of us, a tool like Gremlin um, is, the, is the, the filter between you creating a post and then sharing it on the channel, and then we archive what you say on the channel. So you have a, a pre-review, which is a typical compliance process, and a, and a post review, which we'll call archiving. So you really have to have a pre-review and a post review process to be really protected there. And you can't do that if you post directly to Facebook. However, our technology and, and a number of others that exist would allow you to archive even if you don't post through the tool. So you may have someone who goes directly to Facebook and posts something and we can alert that it's happened and, and archive it. Um, but ultimately I would view it as, uh, if, if there's a compliance person asking this question is, um, have a tool that allows for both pre-review and post-review, um, and I think you've got it covered. Okay, uh, this next one is, does the ABA have a training seminar or a place where employees can train about social media marketing? I will get back to you on that one for, from the ABA standpoint, but if uh, Gremlin has anything to offer in that space, feel free to mention it, Chris. <clears throat> Yeah, we're, we're happy to answer questions about that if someone wants to reach out to us. If you want us to do a training class for an ABA uh, member, we'd be happy to do that. And, and Steve, that may be even something we talk about setting up in the future with you. Um, and we do have some other partners who do training depending on the size of the organization and how many people need to be trained. So happy to do that. There isn't anything right now in place. There are uh, some classes, I think, that some of our partners have even with the ABA, and we do classes as well. So. Whoever that individual is, maybe ping us by uh, email and we'll give you some examples of how we might be able to help you. Great. Is training required or recommended for all employees? It's a good question. So I'm going to say training is recommended. Um, I haven't seen in the guidance the word required. Clearly there are some back office employees at, at banks who uh, do not pose as much of a risk as those who are client facing or customer facing. and so. Um, they're not going to make it required that everybody at the institution do it. I would say the priority order that I gave early in this presentation talking about uh, compliance and then marketing and then client-facing employees are the ones that you should focus on. Um, I will say that in talking with FDIC folks that it's clear that they believe that training must be issued um, and publicly made to members of the institution. Um, whether that's uh, maybe an online form they have to fill out or a test they have to complete, as opposed to a class, I don't think that's been dictated by any of the regulatory bodies, but I would say over the next year, you're gonna hear more and more about that. Um, you should consider at least training on the policies and procedures of what's personal and what's business social media. The other thing I'll make about training, a comment about training that I didn't bring up earlier is, um, be very, very careful. Most of the policies that banks have written for social media are all the things you shouldn't do and you can't do and all the rules and restrictions. And from what we've talked about today, you're going to put people off if they're told you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. Please take the time to put in what they can do and what you encourage them to do uh, in terms of social media. If you want them to have a LinkedIn profile, tell them what they can do and what they can say there don't tell them all the things they can't do. So mix the do's and the don'ts all together. Make sure you publish it and have it uh, made aware of uh, to all the employees and whatever training process is appropriate at your bank, I would recommend it. 
Okay, next question up is, what is your take on LinkedIn in regards to using LinkedIn Navigator to gather business when an when employee leaves who owns the LinkedIn account? Yeah, that's fascinating. You know, I ran into that because I was dealing with financial advisors and um, I would say that uh, most institutions are reluctant to give something to someone that they can carry with them, but the reality is your LinkedIn carries with you when you leave that job. If you go from ABC Bank to XYZ Bank, it's going to show both banks and your LinkedIn, and you're going to continue to own that network that you've built. So uh, I believe uh, my interpretation of the NLRB would be that um, you own that profile. Now, if conversely, if the institution has helped you set up a, a business Facebook page or a business Twitter, those might be things that can be retained by the institution. But unfortunately, in the case of LinkedIn, it is something that carries with you as an individual. Um, in terms of Navigator, uh, I'm 50-50 on whether you should encourage it or not. Clearly, you should turn off a subscription if they leave the institution uh, and see if there's a way for you to maybe pull back what information they got through it. But while they're there, their LinkedIn represents your bank. And when they leave, they're now their LinkedIn is representing where they're employed in, in the future. So it's going to be unique from bank to bank. Thank you. Uh, can you elaborate some more on using social for employee advocacy and empowerment? Yeah, absolutely. So um, what we've seen in particular on LinkedIn is that for some institutions, LinkedIn has now become a way to talk to employees. Once you reach a certain size and you may not be using the intranet to talk about the local run or the race or the walk or uh, things that you're doing in the community, we've actually seen banks posting exciting things going on that the bank is involved in on their LinkedIn and then having that reshared and liked and followed by employees. This is true on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on some occasions on Twitter. And what you're getting is you're essentially getting that, that employee to start saying, hey, we're sponsoring the upcoming Komen race or we're sponsoring the upcoming uh, uh, you know, Memorial Day event um, be sure to come by the XYZ bank uh, tent at the memorial event, uh, at the, uh, you know, on, on Arc Hill, whatever the case is, wherever the, the event is. And so um, we think it's an opportunity for you to engage employees to share what's going on. We've also seen it done in terms of education. So a, a great article that the bank publishes about, for example, what does your credit score mean to your overall financial history? and how can it help you or hurt you and you're getting your next loan, those types of articles get shared uh, and liked and followed, and those employees are then sharing information that you've provided to educate people at the, uh, you know, you provided it to employees and, and customers, and those employees are resharing it. Um, the last thing that I'll say is that when you uh, use it as a communication vehicle directly to employees, um, they're going to hear more and more about the great things that you're doing, you're educating, your community engagement, and that's going to drive them to be more excited about being a member, uh, an employee. And when they share it, there's an incredible advocacy that happens when someone shares something. Um, think about it this way, Steve. If I asked you for a great restaurant in Washington, D.C., and you gave me the name of that restaurant, think about what happens when you tell me to have dinner at that restaurant. You've recommended it to me. Now, I'm interested in trying it because you've recommended it, and you're more likely to be loyal because you have recommended it. So sharing content in a small way is a similar loyalty engager for employees, and I think um, institutions can gain a lot from focusing on that. Okay, thank you. The questions are coming in fast and furiously, so I don't know if we'll be able to get through them all today, but I think if we make a hard stop in, say, like seven minutes, we'll get everyone else answered offline. But uh, next question sure. up is, uh, we have already partnered with a company for compliance tracking, but marketing needs a company to help with posts. Does your company help with just content, as in a la carte service? So our primary uh, role is actually to do the marketing uh, posting as well as the compliance archiving. Um, we do increasingly have requests for help in terms of content strategy, which we provide. Um, and we have, in some cases, actually helped with content. It is a bit of a fine line, though, because the question is, if a bank is wanting to write, let's say, a, 
a, a lengthy article with a lot of visuals and graphics, it might be easier for them to work with their ad agency to create that content if they have an ad agency and have us help with the strategy and the posting. Um, but there are some occasions where we can definitely, uh, uh, we would definitely be happy to provide a creative strategy and a content strategy for an institution. That's something we can do. In terms of creating the content, we'd have to know a little bit more about that institution and whether it's better to come from inside the institution and at, with their ad agency or whether it's something we could help with. We want to leverage the expertise that exists. Uh, one great point about content I can say is it doesn't all have to be original. We see institutions being very effective at using content libraries that we can recommend to them and, and other portals that create content. The Gremlin tool has an RSS feed that feeds uh, numerous other types of, of content and articles into you for you to reshare. You don't have to write everything new. You can be sharing awesome content that's been written somewhere else by someone else, but your institution gets credit when you publish it and share it. So uh, happy to talk further about that. Um, whoever that is, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Okay, next question up is, what is your opinion on customer complaints received through social media? Does the institution respond to every concern or only escalated concerns? What about posts from customers that state they don't like your bank? So each, uh, this is each institution has its own guidelines, so I am not uh, authorized by the FDIC or FFIEC to give guidance on this matter, but I'll give you my opinion. From my experience, um, I would say that if a consumer complaint raises an issue that the institution has done something wrong, there's typically a process that refers that through a consumer complaint group or even a potentially legal group. If an accusation is made that is considered to be a legal issue, you have to address that typically. Most institutions have a policy. You must address it if it touches on legal ground. If someone just starts ranting about them not liking your ATM or a fee or something like that, the, the policy that we typically take is, is it's best to respond if someone says your ATM didn't work for, for you to respond and say, here's a link to all of our ATM locations. We're sorry this ATM wasn't functioning. We're going to make sure we look into why it wasn't functioning and we appreciate you pointing this out. Um, we're sorry for the inconvenience and maybe even provide the phone number or contact information to take that online conversation offline to try to resolve that individual customer complaint. Where I draw the line, Steve, though, is if someone is really cursing and mad and angry, and when you think of it, it's sort of like the, the protester who shows up at an event who really doesn't want to have a conversation with you. They just want to argue and yell and scream. And in those ca cases, I typically will advise a bank to ignore it. If there's no hope in resolving that customer care issue, if you just have someone who's ranting and raving, it might be best to ignore them because you might just be, you know, kicking a beehive that you don't want to kick. But I'd say 90% of the time, it is a resolvable customer issue, and you reaching out to them can turn it into a very, very positive experience. I have dozens and dozens of examples where someone who was complaining about something got an outreach from the bank, the bank resolved the issue, cleared up the issue, and that person then actually became an advocate of the bank. So turning those things around can be very powerful. Um, I've done some work with J.D. Power and Associates, and they, they would agree with that as well, that turning that social complaint into a positive um, can turn, uh, you know, complainers into advocates. But just make sure they're not cursing at you. If they're cursing at you online, you probably should just ignore it. Okay. I think this will be the last question. The rest will get to the folks offline. But uh, next question up and last one currently is, can I tweet about a business that banks with us thanking them for providing a service or delivering coffee? That's an interesting question. So uh, by and large, I would say that's a, that's a question for the compliance department, but I would say generally yes. We do see that happening a lot and we've not run into that issue. The only time that I've seen that become an issue, Steve, is if a situation where, for example, a financial professional is asked to give a recommendation of another professional, like an attorney or a CPA, and most institutions and regulatory bodies require that you give more than one name if it's a referral situation, um, that you're not supposed to refer just one person, and that might apply to social media as well. But I can tell you, we see a lot of banks who thank their local uh, you know, car dealership for helping some, some out with something or a car rental that helped out somebody. I, we see a lot of businesses thanking businesses, and uh, especially in the community banks, especially in the small and medium-sized banks, that community approach is very powerful 
um, where uh, you know banks and other local businesses thank each other and help each other out. We see a lot of it. Um, the other thing I'll comment on top of that that is also extremely powerful, and it came up in John's presentation, is when you can promote your involvement with charity and civic and community organizations, um, we've actually seen as much of a positive response from that as thanking even other businesses. So uh, make sure you're getting the appropriate credit that your bank deserves by talking about the great things you're doing in the community. Um, if you're a community bank or a regional bank, talk about the things you're doing to be part of that community. Let's help make social media a tool to turn some of the negative views about the banking industry into positives. Use social media as a tool to talk about the great things your bank is doing. Okay, well thank you. We'll get the answer all the rest of the questions offline, but I would like to thank today's speakers, Chris Maloney and John Krupella for their informative presentation on Gremlin's social media marketing for banks overcoming the six compliance key hurdles. If any further questions, please feel free to contact myself, Steve Plestak here at the ABA, 202-663-5577. This concludes today's webinar, and have a pleasant afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.